For those of you who don't know Brad, just a few facts about him that we'll talk about. He started five companies from scratch. He has started XPO with a $150 million investment, and it's now a global freight transportation logistics giant. Uh, he has made over 500 acquisitions throughout his career and raised $25 billion of capital. And the reason I bring all of this up is because we will certainly talk about what all that means in a very new economic environment. Brad, thank you so much for joining us. You know, the topic of this panel is the next big thing. What I promised you we would do is talk about your next big thing okay. <laughs> and then the next big thing in the economy. I think what's interesting is you're starting your next big thing at a time when a lot of people would be afraid to start a new venture. The economy is really rocky. How are you thinking about starting from scratch? It's, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to you. Um, it's the very best time to start a business is when things are bad and when valuations are low. You don't want to start a business up here. You want to start a business around here. You may not be able to time it to be right here, but somewhere around here you want to do that. So some would say that, but the cost of capital is also rising. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, then how do you start a business when financing becomes harder to come by? And as you've made the point to me before, you know, all tides are not rising anymore. Cost of capital is definitely rising. You have equity values have comp compressed, so the cost is up. On the debt, when we spun off GXO, our warehouse business, our supply chain business, about a year ago, we got the debt done at about 1.5%. Uh, we're in the market now for the RXO spin-off debt. I'll consider it a victory if we get 7 or 8% on, on that. And it's, and it's a great credit. It's a very low CapEx, high free cash flow conversion. So the, market, the cost of debt has gone up dramatically. The 8% that you're talking about, is that completely a function of higher interest rates driven by the Fed's rising interest rates? Or is this a function also of investor sentiment souring if that's the case, if the latter is the case, then how do you convince investors to get on your side on something completely new and unproven? Well, so there's two things. One is the RxO spin, which is far from unproven because it's got a long track record of generating tons and tons of free cash flow. It's a best in class. It's a, it's, it's a great company. So I feel uh, happy that we're part of the haves as opposed to have not, nots. There's a lot of companies that are, the markets are closed for. In Europe, I mean, it's essentially closed for, for small companies. So I'm happy about that. In terms of my new thing, I'm not worried about raising capital. That's the last thing I'm worried about. What, what I'm concerned about is I got to find something that five years later, seven years later, the revenue is much higher, the EBITDA is much higher, and during that period of time, we generate a bunch of free cash flow, regardless of the economic cycle and how long this impending recession lasts. That, that's the main thing to focus on. If you, if you run a business that's got good growth dynamics to it, and the financial model is solid, there's capital. I mean, there's, I mean, look at this room. It's like a trillion dollars of capital, trillions of dollars of capital just here. So interesting, that optimism, it's funny because on one hand, you're starting something completely new. On the other hand, a lot of people are in this market. I wrote a newsletter just a couple of weeks ago saying that it's the grand possibility of new beginnings. People right now making the biggest changes of their career. So as you kind of look at the next phase of your career as you leave XPO, what are the industries, what are the sectors that you see most promise in uh, to, to do something new in? Well, we're, so I've done this a few times before, and um, where I ended up was different than where I started. And I barely started the hunt because I'm still gainfully employed at XPO. So I got a few more weeks where I'm running that company. And I got to get the spin done, and there's a lot of things going on. But generally, I'm going to be looking at large parts, large businesses, so large, large to total addressable markets so that even if there's a downturn, you're such a tiny percent of something so huge, you grab some share, you can still grow really fast. So I'm going to look at financial services, I'm going to look at healthcare. A lot, of, a lot of inbounds have come from these SPACs that were $10 a share nine months ago, and now we're $1.82. And, and, and most of them belong at $1.82. But I'm not looking for a lot, just looking for one. So there could be some of those fallen SPACs where there's actually value, like a lot of value, but they're just in the wrong place at the wrong time, and there's, there's no demand for them. Well, is that a trading opportunity for you, or is that an investment opportunity where you can see the chance to take a prior investment vehicle and turn it into something new? It's both. I, I don't think it's an either or. When you're, when you're building a company, timing matters because your IC and ROIC changes where you're, when you're getting it on the cycle. So I, I like getting it on the cycle here 
And, and I think the opportunity to create a lot of alpha over a period of time is a lot easier when you're starting here. It's harder when you're starting here, well, much harder. Well, to that end also, you know, you're talking about SPACs. That's one example of kind of the market exuberance over the last year or so, let alone the last 10 years, if you will. Yeah. So, you know, if you kind of look at the market all around you, at what point are things getting to the point that valuations are more realistic, that behavior is more realistic? Well, valuations are certainly more realistic than they were even a few months ago because valuations have compressed. Have they gotten to, and a lot of the froth is out. You don't see a lot of these, you know, the tech has come down, industrial has come down, consumer pack, they've all come down. I mean, nothing's expanded, Every, everything's contracted. So it's certainly more reasonable valuations. Could they get more reasonable over the next few months? They probably could, yes. Reasonable, but can they overshoot as well? You know, there's a lot of talk this week about Jamie Dimon's 20% drawdown prediction, six to nine months of a recession. What do you think will happen next? I think, um, we're probably at the point, so when you get all the, the brilliant minds all agreeing that it's going to crash, that's usually what you see right before the capitulation. And then there, then there's a, there is a crash, but it doesn't last a long time. Because then, then it overswings to the other. So there was this overvaluations for quite a long period of time. So now the pendulum has to swing. It's like physics. There's momentum for it to go back down, and it's gonna, it will overswing. And there'll be bargains out there. And you've got to be bold, and you've got to be courageous, and you've got to be decisive, and, and be, have conviction and make your move. So to the extent that you see a sharp drawdown, what does it look like on the other end? Remember, we are still uh, you know, paying homage to the fact that we are going into a new economic paradigm with higher interest rates. How do you kind of map out the way out of a downturn? I'm short term, a little nervous, a little pessimistic. I'm medium and long term, extremely bullish. And I say that because I have a little different echo chamber than here. My echo chamber is I'm talking to CEOs of, of large companies and chief supply chain officers of large companies and entrepreneurs of small businesses. And I'm talking with the 160,000 employees we have between GXO and RxO and XPO. And particularly here in the United States, the entrepreneurialism and the dynamism and the American dream, it is very much alive. And people are optimistic and they're thinking longer term. And they're, there's so many people with so many great ideas many more ideas than anyone can finance, that will create a lot of value. And, and as long as the government doesn't get too much in the way and overregulate and overtax, the entrepreneurial spirit in America is going gonna, is gonna to continue. And so I'm very optimistic. And I think, when th I think short term is not going to be so nice. Long term is going to be very nice. So in the short term then, you know, what do the next six months look like? Do you think that if we experienced a downturn, that it could rival the great financial crisis? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. And, uh, but it could. I, I, th I think it could. And the reason I say that is when you talk to investors, fear, it reminds me a little bit of summer 2007, when everything was great and everyone, there was those pick toggles, debt was basically free and no confidence, that kind of stuff. It was like very frothy and crazy. And then suddenly everyone got scared. And then, and then everybody got really scared. And, and I'm starting to feel that scaredness, that fright. Uh, becoming more intense and more pervasive, which is kind of what you see right before the final capitulation. Well, it's interesting. You know, you can say that free money causes irrational behavior, but so co does fear in a lot of in a lot of ways. What do you think in the next six months uh, can be done to kind of save some mistakes in the investing community and in the entrepreneurial community among the CEOs that you speak to? Investing requires, and running a business requires, trying to be aware of your biases towards hope and fear, and trying to get out, trying to be aware that you're being too hopeful and too optimistic, and you're, you're extrapolating from the present or the recent past that's going to continue to be really good, or the opposite, on the fear side, and then try to get in the middle zone, try to get in the, in the center of that. So it's a psychological thing. Try to get divorced from the emotion of the whole thing. On the supply chain side of things, where are you seeing easing and where are you seeing problems that are maybe more sticky then we have the toolkit to deal with. Supply chain has come unclogged a lot in the last three, four months. So air and ocean rates have come down dramatically, like, like 80%, big, big moves. Uh, spot uh, full truckload rates have come down 30, 35%. And these are big moves, these are very big moves. Contract rates, not so much, because people who were, who were procuring capacity in the spot market have PTSD from the pandemic when they couldn't find a truck. 
And so they're, they're, lo they're locking in contracts. So there's kind of demand for the contract market. And of course, we play at XPO more in the less than truckload business, which has very consolidated carrier base. So there's actually firm pricing in that. So it depends what part of the supply chain we're talking about. But overall, air, ocean, rail, truck, it's, it's gotten a lot, lot, it's more fulsome. There is more capacity and the pricing is better. So the main thing holding back the economy now is not supply chain glitches, which, which, were the case, which was the case before. As you think about your next move and, and the next business that you want to run, you know, what are the tenants? What are the things that you know, you've learned over the last five companies? Things that have changed. We've talked about a few of them, including political risk to financing. What are the things that you have to take with you in your toolkit? For the next business? You have to have a way to grow a business. You can't create, I don't know how to create, so all of the companies that I've run have been what we call 10 plus baggers. So I'm not a private equity firm trying to make two or three X. I'm looking for 20 X, 30 X, look for the hit it out of the park kind of stuff. And luckily, we've been done that in every single one of the companies I started so far. So I'm looking for big ideas, ones that are very scalable. I don't know how to create immense shareholder value without it meant change and transformation of companies, top line growth, margin expansion. So, so that's the key. How do we find things that we can either roll, grow by M&A, which, which if done correctly can be very, very creative, or, and or grow instead of by a roll up, a roll out. So that, by that what I mean is, like we did at United Rentals, we did, yes, we did a bunch of acquisitions and the media loved all that stuff, but where the real ROIC was on the, the Greenfield Cold Start locations. We opened a few hundred de novo locations, and the invested capital was much, much less than when you bought a company. The risk was less, and it was all standardized. So something that can be rinse, wash, repeat, so to speak. We have a good template. We just keep opening, opening, opening all over the country or, or, or in, in Europe, too, or, or wherever. Or just good old-fashioned sales and marketing, something that there's a lot of demand for, and you can grow by price and volume. That's a little tougher because you're betting on you're, you're predicting the trend, right. which sometimes is right, but it isn't always right. Well, also, how much more difficult is that kind of a formula in a world with higher interest rates as well as higher input costs? Do you have to accept lower margins given that the input is higher? I don't know about lower margins, but your interest costs will be higher. I mean, somebody, I'm sure somebody has, but I haven't seen it yet. Someone should do a report on take the S&P 500, how much of the debt at the S&P 500 is variable cost debt, take out the fixed stuff, variable cost, and how much does each one point tax the country in terms of extra in interest burden? I, I don't know the answer, but I know it's a big number, it's a very big number, and that's one of the things that is slowing down the, the growth, growth of the country. But in terms of creating alpha, look, I, you can grow alpha in a, when you have interest rates in the high single digits, but that's, that's, it's not like it's Argentina here. It's, it's, a, you know, reason, it's still, but we were a little spoiled with, with very, very cheap debt. Okay, that's done. That's done at least for the foreseeable future. Maybe it'll come back actually in some number of years, but that's not going to happen in the next few years. That doesn't, that, just, that cleans, one healthy thing about this whole clean out is it cleans out. It cleans out the weaker players, cleans out the weaker competitors. It cleans out competitors in industries that were pricing irrationally just to get volume growth. So it, it's not all bad. A recession is like a, like a big rainstorm. You know, it's not fun, but actually there's some benefit to rain. It encourages growth. So, as everyone here already knows, my favorite question. <laughs> you know, as you look ahead, start a new business, have, have started five before, as many others, as we had mentioned, are also starting a new time frame in their lives, new jobs, you know, new, navigating an economic environment they haven't seen before. What are the biggest mistakes? What are the biggest mistakes that you are seeing out there that you hope to avoid in your next role? Look, uh, I've made every mistake you can make on acquisitions, on people, on tech, on development. The good news is the num a percentage of mistakes of all the decisions we've made has been small, and there was no mistake that was life-threatening. So we've, we've you look, you have to make mistakes. Otherwise, you're not doing a lot of stuff. You're not going to create a huge amount of value unless you're doing a lot of stuff and, and being decisive and, and courageous. And, and you're going to get some stuff wrong. As long as you're honest with yourself like, and recognize those mistakes early, after, soon after you've made them, and course correct with no ego, just, okay, I, made, I messed up, let's fix that, let's get back on, and create a culture inside your company where, where you're not just saying everything's great, and you're actually focusing more on the things that are, are, that are not great. The things that are not great give you the opportunities to create value. 
the things that you're doing. So going around and trying to find where is there waste in the process, where, is there, where are the inefficiencies, where can Lean Six Sigma really go in there and op optimize, that's how you create margin. That's how you create return on capital, which is what it's all about in the end. Are we recommending Lead Six Sigma and analysis for more investors out there? Lead Six Sigma is great. It's a great, great invention. So uh, final words on what, what your next act will be? I don't know. It's going to make a lot of money, hopefully, but I don't know what it is yet. <laughs> Fred, thank you so much for your time. What an interesting time to be interviewing you at. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you very much.